Television, to me, is a moral transaction. Someone on that side of the camera is sitting there giving you and me a half hour or an hour of their life, which they will never get back. You can't go and say, give me back that hour I just spent watching that broadcast. So if you've got to give them something of value, a, trans a, 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 a transaction that gives them value for the value you're getting from the conversation. Bill, thank you so much for taking this opportunity to speak with us. I know our viewers are excited. I'm way excited about this opportunity. You're here in Memphis at the American Public Television Marketplace to talk about a new book and a new series. Can you tell us a little bit about both of those? Well, I retired last year, 18 months ago, but I have no retirement skills. So after this period of time, I've decided to come back to public television with another weekly series of What's on my mind, the editor of the first newspaper in this country, Boston, 1691, said his mandate was to give an account of such considerable things as have come to his attention. And a lot of things come to my attention, and I just wanted to get back and share them with, with our audience. So we'll begin a new series in January. And it won't be totally unlike the former, where I sat down with a lot of interesting people and talked about what's on their mind, what they see about what's happening in the country. They range from John Stewart, the comedian, to uh, uh, Barry Lopez, the writer. I really believe the conversation of democracy, as I call it, uh, includes all kinds of voices. So those are the kinds of people I'll be bringing back to the air starting in January. They were both guests on the journal. Tell me a little bit about your feelings about public media. You're what I would call evangelical about our industry. And how do you feel we're doing today? Well, I was present at the creation of public broadcasting back in the mid-60s when Lyndon Johnson passed and signed the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. Our thesis was that there needs to be one channel, at least one channel, that is free of commercials and commercial values. Because when you're producing for a commercial network, you look out and think of your audience as an audience of consumers waiting to buy something. So you want to sell them something. But if you look out and see that your audience is a community of citizens wanting to be informed, it's a different relationship between what you do and what they receive. So we need a channel on the spectrum that can really address the issues that we face as a country and as individuals in our lives without regard to whether we're going to sell advertising or not, bring eyeballs to the uh, screen to pass along something that's being sold. Uh, public media today is more important than ever because we have hundreds of channels and we're constantly barraged with uh, salesmanship, commodities, advertising, amusement, uh, sports, all of those are fine, but they don't address the main issues of what kind of uh, how, how are we going to solve these enormous problems that we have? So public media tries to do that, tries to give breathing room, time, space to people who have ideas, who believe in learning, who want to take what they see and hear and do something with it in their communities and in their country. So we need that more than ever today. We need what you're doing in Cookville and what others all across the country are doing. How important are stations, local stations, like WCTE, to this mission, to working within their communities? I suspect that I have, as an on-air journalist, visited more local public television stations than any other of my colleagues over the last 40 years. Because when I began in broadcast television, public television, in 1971, I realized that uh, stations are the bones of public broadcasting. They are what hold us together, what embody us in, in, in Cookville and, 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 other, and other towns. So I went around all over the country time and again raising funds for local stations, meeting with uh, the viewers, meeting with the managers, meeting with people like you. And I came to realize that those, those stations are the connection to the public in public broadcasting. And that public cuts across gender lines, ethnic lines, racial lines, uh, all of that. But they are people who care about the life of the mind, the life of the spirit, world of learning, world of ideas. Uh, and without the local public television station, there would be, as far as I can tell, no voice for these people, no outlet for non-commercial uh, values and ideas. 
in all of these communities across the country. You challenged us, though. You challenged us to, to have a, a stronger voice, to take a stand within our communities and, and to really find out those issues that are hurting us as a community, to give us pause. Yeah, I think it's very important for public television to be an ombudsman in the communities, to give a forum to people who have grievances against, um, against the city government or the school administration or who have complaints, who have maybe they've been harassed uh, by this institution or that institution. And without a newspaper, a strong, independent newspaper, they have nobody picking taking, giving them a, a chance to be heard. I think forums on uh, all kinds of issues, giving people in the town a chance to get together and debate, argue with each other in a civil way. I, I can't, I think we have too much ranting and too much uh, anger and malice in our public discourse today, but I think that's a great public service. Let me ask you about that, about the anger. It seems like we're so polarized as a nation and that there's been a loss of civility. What can we do about that undercurrent of anger? Well, we can lower our voices. We can lower our voices for one thing. We can turn away from the angriest voices that are trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Uh, we, we have some control over it. If, if you don't respond when people shout, then maybe they'll stop shouting. Uh, if you tell your own supporters, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, if you think your candidates or your representatives are appealing to the lowest common denominator, the, the worst angels of our nature, you ought to say something about it. But, you know, to everybody else, I say take a deep breath, think about what you want to say, and realize that you're more likely to make your point if you are listened to instead of if you're rejected uh, in, in, in what you say. You referenced in your last show, I believe you were speaking about hope, you said the fact that hope can be toxic if you hold it long enough without some resolution or action. And today you talked about the crisis of hope. What can we do about that crisis? Well, you know, the, fun, the core of the American dream is that my children are, will have a chance to do better than I did. Uh, that's not true anymore. The fact of the matter is social mobility, upward mobility in this country has come to a halt. We are about, we're behind countries like uh, Greece and, I mean, uh, Spain and Italy and uh, France and Norway in the rate of social mobility of people from one generation doing better than their parents' generation. And that's one reason for the loss of hope. There's also a sense that, that our, uh, and it's true, there's, our political institutions are not working. Uh, Washington is stymied, it's paralyzed, it's polarized. Um, the economy is not working for the broad majority of people. So hope, which has always been the anticipation that I will make it, that I will find a way to buy a home, raise a family, have a secure retirement, those are in shatters right now for millions upon millions of, of people. We have to begin to recognize that part of this, much, much of this is the result of the fact that over the last 30 years, public officials in this country have changed the rules of politics and economy in order to favor the, the privileged few over everybody else. And we've got to start holding our politicians accountable for serving, for serving the wealthy, the corporations, the organized interests more than they're serving the interests of individuals who are looking for a way uh, to make it in this country. You're a man of faith. In fact, you're an ordained Baptist minister. How do, we, how do we remain faithful when it seems like the system is broken? Well, I started out, I grew up in a very conservative Christian church in East Texas, uh, went on to the University of Texas, moved, went to seminary, got a Master of Divinity, thinking I was actually going to teach in the field of, of religion and society. Uh, instead, I decided, rather than teaching, to practice what I was, would, have, would have taught. So I wound up in government and politics and then in journalism. Uh, and I've had a good life at it. And uh, I, I would say that I, I, I'm not where I was 50 years ago in terms of my own faith, but I'm still open to, uh, to the transcendent. I'm open to uh, insights that come from unexpected uh, places. And I say to, to a question like that, I would say, well, what do you have your faith in? I mean, you, you need to have faith in democracy, but you need to make it work. You need to have faith in yourself, but you also have to, uh, to practice what you, 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 you want to be. Uh, you just have to, in hard times, remember that, that faith is not about 
uh, prosperity. It's not the prosperity gospel. It's not uh, making money from, out, from, from your beliefs, but it's what motivates you to want to make yourself a better person and the world a better place. And so you always have to test what uh, you're doing against those realities. What do you think has impacted your growth in that area? Do, do you think it's the variety of people that you meet? What's well, life's experiences? I mean, I've, uh, you travel the world, you suddenly realize that what you thought was the only way that God was addressed in a small town in East Texas, God's addressed in different ways in small towns all over the world. And you, you, you have to say, well, wait a minute, uh, maybe my way is a good way, but it's not the only way because if it were, why are they doing what they are doing? A lot of reading, lots of exposure to people of ideas, uh, a lot of uh, reflection based upon what I have experienced. I mean, life is a continuing process in adult education. And you learn different ways of thinking about God from the way you did when you were 20 years old or thinking about other people. So it's exposure to a variety of, of, of people, to many different experiences. And, and reflecting on those experiences and those people and asking yourself, does that fit me? Is, is, is that right for me? What do I think about that? Do you find that we're more alike than different? Well, we, I think what most people want is, 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 a, is a decent life, a chance for their children, a, a security and a, 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 a safe old age. I think in those sen that, that sense we are alike, I think that we are kindred spirits in terms of our fundamental uh, being, but I also think politics changes us, economics changes us, war changes us, ambition changes us, greed changes us, and, and so some people are more greedy than others, some people are more warlike, some people are more pacifist, peaceful than others. And so in the expression of who we are, it, we find many avenues opening up and sometimes they come into conflict with, with others. We know that being partners is key. In fact, today you spoke about the incredible partnerships needed in our own industry. And yet it's beyond that. You have an incredible partnership with your wife. You have a long-standing marriage. And so what does that mean to you? What does that partnership mean to you? Well, it means constant testing uh, because it's not easy to live together 57 years if you are going to be an individual, but at the same time a partner, as you say, often conflicts. You have to learn that, that uh, the immediate uh, uh, anger or the immediate discomfort uh, is a passing phenomenon, and you have to know that other person to be essentially and basically a, a, a good person. I, I see goodness in my wife all the time. She does occasionally in me. Uh, and we recognize that when we're not always good, that, there, that there's that, there's that, there's that uh, rock on which we based our commitment to, to each other. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a, a, a lot of lowering your voice uh, when you would rather raise it. Uh, and it, it, it means, you know, it's like a, a, a good waltz, a good dance. You don't step on the other person's toes. If you do, they can't dance and you'll feel, you'll be tripped up too. So you learn to, to dance in ways that create a pattern but don't, uh, but, but don't trip up the other person. When you decided to come out of retirement, what really challenged you to do that? I mean, you seemed so adamant before about leaving. Well, I've re retired several times because this is hard work. A weekly series, raising money, uh, making it happen, you, it, it, it is hard work. And so from time to time, I've taken uh, deep breaths. I've stepped outside of the, uh, of the work and uh, replenished my spirit replenished my mind, read a lot, traveled a lot, uh, raised money for the next round. Uh, when I did it last time, I was 76, and I thought, well, that's enough. You know, I've really been doing it 40 years, and it's time to move on. But in the next six or eight months, people would stop me and say, I miss what you were doing. Uh, I mean, coming up from the subway, on the train, down to Washington, at the airport, people on the street, they just say, I miss your program. Why don't you come back? And well, I didn't really have an answer for that. I didn't have an excuse uh, for that. And uh, then the way the world has gone, I've been around a long time, have some insights, have some experience. Uh, why not share it? Um, and I just decided one day that, uh, that hey, I don't play golf, I don't play bridge. Uh, and if I did, I'd still feel that that wasn't sufficient. I, I love my work. I, and I love it because it's teamwork. 
it's a collaborative medium. All you have to do, if your viewer is good, is look around and see uh, the camera operator, the sound engineer, the lighting technician, the makeup artist. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great team effort, and it's a lot more fun in this world playing on a team than it is going solo. Uh, now, so as you age, you discover your friends are aging out, died off, moved on, and you suddenly realize that uh, you're not ready to head for the rocking chair. So why not do what you've been doing for 40 years if you have the chance to do it and if you still have the energy and the health to do it? And at the moment, I do. Well, I'm thrilled you're back, and I know so many of our viewers are thrilled that you're back. You told a story this morning about a woman who approached you in the train station that was so fun. Do you mind sharing that? It was such a fun story. No, it actually happened uh, a week or so ago. I had been in Washington filming for our new series, and I'd gone to Union Station, which is the big railroad station there for the trains back to New York. And I was sitting, actually, at, at the near the gate, and this lady came up to me. She didn't immediately come to me. She was, I could tell that, that glint of recognition 10 or 12 yards away. You, if you're walking on the street and you know somebody who has recognized you and you recognize that they have recognized you, there, you, there's a connection. So I saw this connection, but it was a quizzical look in her eyes. So she came up to me and she said, were you Bill Moyers? Were you Bill Moyers? And I said, once upon a time. I mean, uh, and she said, well, I'll be darned. I didn't think you were still with us. And I said, well, I think I am. And then she, I said, maybe you're thinking of some of the old timers who've gone on, friends and colleagues of mine, like David Brinkley, or Paul Duke, or uh, Walter Cronkite. Uh, she said, no, she said, I just know, I just know that, that I always watched you when you were alive. <laughs> so I, you know. That's fun. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah so I said uh, to your audience this morning that I, she'll have another chance to see me in January when Moyers and Company uh, comes back, comes on the air, but I hope she doesn't confuse it for The Walking Dead, which is one of the most popular series in the country right now. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a huge hit on cable. You know, you always have such a diversity of guests, and I can't wait to see your new series, just to see who you're going to have on. They come from all different walks of life, and, and you have such a great skill of engaging them, and then they engage us. How do you choose your guests? Curiosity, intuition. I mean, I read something and I think that person sounds, uh, certainly writes well. I wonder if he or she talks well or they have an idea that I think others should share. Most of the time it's that I come across something that excites me and I think if other people uh, saw it or experienced it, it would excite them too. Um, but it's largely just my own intuition about uh, the ability of this person to, to break through to others. They broke through to me, so why shouldn't they break through uh, to others. I read widely in science and religion and uh, economics and politics and uh, anthropology. I, I was a good student in high school and college, and journalists are good students. Uh, I said a moment ago, a continuing course in adult education. That's what journalism has been uh, for me. You know, I, I think also a force in coming back, a factor in coming back, was that few of us, few people, have the opportunity to have an idea one day and a month or two months or three months from now to see it on the screen, share it with other people. I think of television as a kind of campfire. If you build a little circle here and create um, a conversation that's interesting, then from out of the darkness, out there beyond the camera, uh, other people come and they sit around in their homes or their li in their living rooms or uh, in their dens and they share for 30 minutes or an hour in that experience of the campfire. And that's the metaphor that I think still prevails for our work, even though there are, the hills are alive with burning campfires now. But I still think when people discover a circle of intimacy, where quietly and, and reflectively they can experience the wondrous uh, miracle of two minds trying to connect and often connecting, it's like eavesdropping on visitors in your home when you were a kid and you'd hear your parents talking about something interesting and your ear would cock and your attention would be directed toward it and you felt something you couldn't even define then but you knew was adding to, you, you would later realize it had added to your experience. I think that's what audiences do when they listen to us so I always try to choose carefully people 
who are worth a half hour, hour of your time. Television, to me, is a moral transaction. Someone on that side of the camera is sitting there giving you and me a half hour or an hour of their life, which they will never get back. You can't go and say, give me back that hour I just spent watching that broadcast. So if you've got to give them something of value, a, trans a, 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 a transaction that gives them value for the value you're getting from the conversation. So to me, it's, that, that's the sense of, of urgency uh, in, in, in what we are doing when we're talking, that somebody's watching whose life will be touched or untouched or not, but they'll never get that time back. Bill, I can't tell you how much this means to me that you've taken this time and that you've given us this opportunity. I have to tell you that it just seemed impossible to me. I had a viewer, a friend of mine, Marilee Hall, who suggested that I call you to do an interview for one-on-one, -on -one. and I just laughed because I thought that's, that's not possible, and yet here you are. You granted this opportunity, and I think, I think that's what you bring to the television. I think you bring that you're approachable, and that resonates with the viewers, that we can, we can trust you, and they can trust this setting between us. Well, you know, I'm flattered by that, and I have no idea why it is. I'm, I'm just a journalist doing my work in public, and I think that it's the, it, it's the, it's the people I have on who rub off on me, so people think I'm as smart as the scientists I've just interviewed, or as good as the, divine, the, 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 the clergy I've just interviewed, uh, or as knowing as the economy. I'm not. I'm a journalist. I mean, I, I ask questions because I don't know the answers. It's, I'm very uncomfortable answering questions. I'm very uncomfortable pretending to be knowledgeable when, when I'm just simply more curious than I am certain. Uh, but it rubs off. There's something about the chemistry of television that makes the interviewer uh, seem on a equal with the interviewed, and that's not the case in my in, in, in my in, in, in my work. I'm not. I don't know anything near what the people I'm talking to know. They're the kind ones, the generous ones, in giving me their time to share with me their life's experiences, their learning, their their, their knowledge, their experience and allowing me to share it with the people watching. And if the audience thinks I'm the subject of the show, it's a failure because I'm not. Uh, it's the person I'm talking to or the documentary I'm presenting, the reporting we are doing. And, but somehow it rubs off on the principal on the camera uh, when, when, when it belongs elsewhere. I want to wrap up in the few minutes that we have left with um, a question from Marilee Hall. She's the person who encouraged me to contact you. What do you feel most positive about in, in your life, in our world? Well, I've had a good life, a lucky life, a fortunate life. Uh, I mean, I've known loss, uh, death in my family and all that, but I personally have con I've been given wonderful opportunities when I've made mistakes and, and, and faltered. I've been given seconds. I've had a good life. Uh, I, I really have, and I've been fortunate to work in the field that, of television at its prime. I mean, I came in the second generation of television, first gener television news, first generation Edward R. Murrow, Eric Severide, Walter Cronkite, that generation. I came after them, and television was still flourishing. Broadcast journalism, broadcast news was flourishing in my mid-years, so I was given a form and, and, and an opportunity that well, I cherish, and, but it's not as available as it is in, in, in our new world as it was. And so it's, 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 the, it's experience, that, that the day's experience. I get up every morning. You know, I don't know how to be in the world without expecting a more confident future and then doing something that day, getting up, doing something to try to bring it about. And when I make a small contribution or I feel that I've used that time to do something that makes a more confident future, I feel very good about it. I'm worried, deeply worried, about the paralysis and polarization in our democracy. Uh, I'm vexed by the growing inequality. The, the have-it-alls are getting more of it, and everyone else is struggling to hang on. Uh, I worry about the fact that we're crowding too many people into the phone booth, you know, a population seven billion now. And uh, sooner or later, we're going to 
we're going to reach the limits of what we can support and sustain. I worry about that. Uh, but I, I'm always, uh, you know, I, pr I practice what a, a great political scientist, Antonio Gra Gramsci, once said, that he practices the pessimism of the mind. That is, you see the world as it is. No rose-colored glasses, no denial. I know something about denial. We had a son who was in denial for 10 years while he was addicted and an alcoholic. We almost lost him because he was in denial and I'm in denial. So I don't de I'm not in denial about the world. Rough place, tough life, tough journey. All kinds of things can happen to you. The pessimism of the mind. I see the world the way it is. But the optimism of the will, the belief that even though the world is the way it is, each of us, particularly I, I know that's the only person I'm responsible for. I can do something that day to try to deal with that, uh, that reality. So the pessimism of the mind, the optimism of the will, a seesaw in a way that keeps balance in your life as you move forward. And everyone can do that? Everyone can affect that kind of change, you think? Theoretically, yes. I mean, obviously there are disabled people. There are people who uh, are, are, are injured and wounded and pained and, and, and their opportunities to say and to do what I just said are less than mine. Uh, but if you have that capacity and you have something to do, now I'm not talking about being on television. I'm talking about whatever it is you, where you work every day, the children you raise, the, the neighbors you have. There are ways to, to touch other people and be responsive. You know, in effect, I, I was in New York at the time, obviously, of the uh, the attacks on the World Trade Center. My office is just down the, 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 a mile or so from there. We lost our engineer who was stationed atop the World Trade Center. Uh, and I watched all those first responders, the firemen and the policemen, go head in the direction of the, of the fires, even though everybody else was coming away. And later on, it, it, struck to me, it struck me that there's a great metaphor. Each of us is everyone else's first responder. We are all first responders to the people within reach of us who have a need, who are hurt, who are wounded, who need a hand, uh, who, 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 knew, who, knew, who need a lift. We're all somebody else's first responder. And uh, I think everybody can do that. I have a wonderful friend who's an autistic. He's 29 now. He's the autistic son of parents who've done everything they can to take care of him. They're passing on, moving on. Uh, they're aging. But at 29 and autistic, he still tries to, he tries to take other kids, other young people uh, to, to the movies, musicals in particular, because it makes him feel good, but it also makes them feel good. I mean, he's changing the world in more ways often than I am. That's fantastic. I, I could just talk to you forever. In fact, I'd just hate to stop talking to you, but thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, and, and I know we all look forward to your new series, Moyers and Company, and your new book, The Conversation Continues. Good luck to you. I mean, what you do is very important. My son uh, moved to Washington, started a great website, burned out in five years, went to Vermont where he's working in the environment. He said to me the other day, Dad, you can have for an ounce of energy expended here, I can have as much influence as a pound of energy expended in Washington. So in your sphere, in your circle, remember, you have an enormous uh, impact. Thank you. Thank you. I will remember that.